So we're ready to start off our second session of the afternoon. Uh, I know we've got a great lineup of presentations. It'll be tough to top uh, what we've already seen so far today. First, a quick plug. Our colleagues at the University of Washington are hosting a global oral health symposium later this summer. So there's more information on this website. It looks like they'll also have a fantastic lineup. So those of you interested in heading to Seattle at the end of July um, can definitely check this out. Uh, to introduce our next speaker, I'd like to call up to the podium a couple of our students. Uh, both of these students worked with me in our Global Oral Health elective this past winter, and uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome them to the stage, William Lee and Nevetha Mathialagan. We have the honor of introducing the next keynote speaker, Dr. Lisa Gibbs. Dr. Gibbs has been a leader in the field of public health research for the last 15 years. She has more than 100 publications to date and is currently leading 15 studies. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Psychology at the University of Melbourne and her PhD in Public Health at Deakin University. Dr. Gibbs is currently at the University of Melbourne where she is Director at the Evidence and Child Health Unit at the Jack Brockhoff Child Health and Wellbeing Program at the Center for Health Equity. She is also the academic lead of the Community Resilience and Public Health Unit at the Center for Disease Management and Public Safety. Lastly, she is a chair of the Children's Lives Research Initiative at the University of Melbourne. Dr. Gibbs's research examines sociocultural and environmental influences on health and well-being. She is most known for her work in disaster recovery and community resilience and in the field of child public health research. Her research is often conducted in partnership with government, service providers, and communities to develop trial strategies to enhance opportunities for children to thrive. These close partnerships often result in a direct translation of research into policy and practice. Her research findings on social influences of post-disaster mental health outcomes have been promoted by the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction and by the Red Cross to guide disaster recovery policy and practice. She is also known for her work in the field of children's public health research. Her, her research on ch child resilience is being used by the Australian Department of Education and Training to upgrade their disaster recovery policies and programs. Her research methods with children have been adopted in the UK, <coughs> excuse me, Sweden, Austria, Canada, Mexico, and New Zealand. In addition to being a full-time researcher, Dr. Gibbs spends much of her time mentoring graduate and professional students at, in the uh, public health at the University of Melbourne. Over the past decade and a half, she has mentored over 20 students. And in 2016, she won the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health Higher Degree Supervision Award, honoring her for, <coughs> excuse me, honoring her for her dedication to her students. Uh, a little tidbit that I just uh, talked to her about, one very interesting hobby she has is that she has, she is a co-author in 10 children's novels for uh, young girls and who uh, she co-authored with her sister. It's very interesting. Uh, her presentation today is titled The Social Context of Child Oral Health. She will be speaking to us about the influence of migration and marginalization poor health literacy, and changing social norms. She will also present some promising cross-sectoral approaches for community-based health promoting change initiatives. Will and I had the pleasure of reading her work in our Global Oral Health Elective last quarter, and now it's a privilege to have her here at UCSF. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Lisa Gibbs. Such a lovely welcome, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here and to hear about the amazing work that's happening. I'm just so glad to, to have this opportunity to be introduced to it and to all of you. Um, I left Melbourne on Saturday morning, left my house reasonably early to get to the airport. I had a nine o'clock flight in the morning, on, on Saturday morning. Transited to Sydney, spent a couple of hours there, then flew from there to San Francisco uh, and was picked up at the airport by Ben when my flight landed Saturday morning, 9.05 a.m. <laughs> so it was a very long five minutes. <laughs> 
And so Ben obviously was tuned into this. We got into his car and he had, a, there was a brown paper bag sitting next to my seat. And he said, oh, this is for you. Uh, I just thought it might come in handy. And I looked in the bag and there was a bottle of chilled water, a banana, a mandarin, and a little block of, of dark chocolate. And I thought, how did he know exactly what I wanted? <laughs> I was blessing him as when I arrived back at the, the hotel and he'd booked me into um, a lovely little boutique hotel in the Japanese sector. So when I wandered out for dinner, I was surrounded by Asian restaurants and had no trouble finding some sushi for dinner that night. So I was in my element. I felt like I was in the right place. And it just brought home to me that social context actually makes a difference because these were my natural choices of what to eat and it was made completely easy for me by Ben's generosity and by where he had situated me in my accommodation. And I could so easily have arrived somewhere and been handed a pack of potato chips and a, and a bottle of Fanta and, um, and been staying at a hotel surrounded by takeaway options that, that were really not quite so healthy. So, you know, it's just that reminder, isn't it, that we make personal choices, but the, the environment that we're in and the social context that we're in really has an influence on, on what's available for us. And that's particularly important for children because they have less control over the, the, their eating choices and their oral health care. And of course, they're learning life habits and developing tastes and understanding how things work. And so the environments that they're in, the different settings that they're in, make a, make a really important difference. And so in our research, we're looking at what's happening in the home for children, what's happening in childcare environments, in the school context, and also in informal care, and particularly care provided by grandparents. And there's a, a current PhD study that's on at the moment that Lauren Carpenter in our team is, is conducting. And she's using some, some data from one of our birth cohort studies, uh, Vic Jen, and she's conducting interviews herself with parent, or she has already done, with parent and grandparent pairs. And it's really interesting to see those differences between what's available in the home environment for children versus childcare versus informal care. And, um, and how that's negotiated as well. And so I, won't, I don't want to be too much of a spoiler for, for Lauren's findings, but we are actually finding that children are exposed or, or are consuming more sweet drinks in home care than they are in formal care and in grandparent care. So that, that was an interesting finding and I can see Nancy's not surprised at all. Um, but you know, when we talk to grandparents, they, they are differentiating between when they have fun visits with their grandchildren coming over versus when they're actually providing daycare, essentially nanny daycare, one of our, our grandparents called it, in which, and they're, they're much stricter in those contexts about what they're, they're giving to their children. And these are things that are negotiated between the parents and the grandparents. And there's a lot of emotion around food and, um, you know, it's a way of showing love. But we found that there was really no emotion, they were very matter of fact, about taking care of the teeth. You know, they had the toothbrush and the toothpaste, they brushed their teeth after their meal. That was very straightforward. And so it was interesting looking at that difference between dealing with nutrition, which we know affects oral health, but dealing with the actual oral care of the teeth. Um, so quite different in the way that's negotiated. The other thing that has been a huge driver, as we all know, in parent choices for their children is convenience. And in our other birth cohort study with one of our other PhD candidates, Rachel Bowick, she found this was a particular driver in parent choices for infant food. And I had never even seen these pouches. How many of you have seen these? Okay, so clearly I'm out of touch. <laughs> Well, after Lauren and Rachel told me about it, I went to the supermarket and as you can see, I picked up a couple for this photo um, and there was just so many of them, these pouches. And they have on the back, the directions are that you squeeze it onto a spoon or onto a plate for the child to eat. But of course, 
that's not what's happening. The kids are sucking out of the pouch and of course it's affecting their development of their, um, you know, their capacity to eat off a spoon. They're not getting the same exposure to different food textures. Um, and they're also carrying them around with them and just periodically having little bits of this food so it's sitting around their teeth as they emerge. So this is actually a concern um, in eating habits that's emerged with a new product that's available and it's this constant tension, isn't it, between our, our awareness of what's healthy and our promotion of that and an increased uptake of health messages battling with new products on the market that are, that are targeting convenience and the busyness of people's lives um, means that that's, that's a real factor in choice. And of course the, the, the other element of that is the way that food is marketed. So this banner I saw at the cinema when I took my, my kids to go and see a movie and I was so appalled that I took multiple photos and sent it to a colleague who leads the Obesity po Policy Coalition and is a bit of an activist. And essentially what it's telling you is this fruit whip is healthier than an apple. <laughs> so you and I can see that that, you know, you see straight through that for what it is, but not everybody is in that same position to make those, to make that distinction. And if, particularly if you're thinking about someone who's where English is a second language and they haven't had the same e education around nutrition, this is, um, you know, a really probably compelling piece of advertising. So I guess, you know, when we're thinking about these social influences on child oral health, it's not just about the, the environments that we have control over, but it's also about the broader policy and um, environmental factors. And those who are at more risk are those who uh, perhaps have less education, um, are in areas that, uh, well, you know, we know that areas with more social disadvantage and more poverty also have a higher incidence of takeaway uh, venues and a lower availability of fresh food. So, you know, the environments are, can be working against us. And of course, there are socio-cultural factors as well that can work in favour or against um, oral health outcomes. And now I asked Ben earlier today if any of you have seen this book. I've got a copy here, so some of you have. It was actually produced in America. It's a lovely children's book about rituals for what you do when the first teeth fall out and showing that, you know, in, in our culture you, you leave the tooth for the tooth fairy and um, if the tooth fairies are a good parent, they leave um, money. <laughs> and <laughs> if they're forgetful like me, they're too busy. They must have been, there must have been a lot of teeth that night, and so they leave extra money the next night. Because <laughs> there's the guilt factor. Um, but this book is fabulous because it shows that in some countries you throw your tooth on the roof, in other countries you might bury your, you know, I think it's you bury the bottom teeth in the ground and the top teeth on the roof, I don't know. It gets complicated and there's a little mouse that apparently takes it in other countries and lovely. So just a really nice example and a reminder for all of us that even though we have well established understandings of, of the role of teeth and how we take care for them, they vary around the world and we can't make assumptions about that. And certainly, you know, in our research, both in the obesity prevention field and in oral health, we learn a lot about the different factors that are influencing choices. Uh, you know, people who have come from countries where the water's not safe to drink are not going to be drinking the water when they arrive in, in their new country. They just take it for granted that you don't drink water and they haven't developed a taste for it. Uh, and so they're buying soft drink as the, as the everyday drink without any awareness that the sugar is going to be affecting their child's teeth. We had a, a project that I wasn't involved in in Melbourne some time ago where they were working with families from an African background where the smile is a really important part of their, their cultural exchange. And so th rather than targeting the health implications of soft drink, they were able to talk about the fact that it can affect your smile and, um, and got some traction that way. The other thing in, in famine-affected countries, of course, is that being large 
is considered beautiful because it means you're healthy and wealthy. And so foods that are high in fat and sugar are sought after in an environment where they're, where they're not readily available. But of course, when you arrive in your host country, they're everywhere. And it seems when you look around that everybody else is eating them as well. And so it can become part of the regular diet very quickly. In our research, we, um, we came across the muswag stick. How many people are familiar with the muswag? Okay, so quite a lot. For, right up front, apologies because it's not part of my cultural background and I, if I misrepresent, I apologise. We were in working with a community health centre on a child obesity prevention study and working really closely and one of the health promotion officers who was working on oral health was reporting back at our regular meeting and saying that she'd been talking to families at kindergartens at local churches, families who'd come from from other countries and started hearing about the miswak and a whole range of other traditional practices around taking care of teeth. And the miswak is a, is a stick that, you know, these were African communities and it comes from the Iraq tree, where they actually chew the end of the stick, it's quite soft, so it becomes frayed as you can see, and then use it to clean the teeth. And it's a traditional method, but it's also for many families tied up with cultural and religious beliefs. So some people were using it every time before they prayed, to be clean before they, they prayed. Um, it's also used by, by some uh, Aboriginal communities in Northern Australia. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's not an unusual phenomenon, but um, when we spoke to the, the um, staff in the community dental clinic, had, were they aware of it? They weren't aware of it, and they weren't aware of uh, some of the other traditional practices because that wasn't a conversation that they were having with the patients when they came in. But they did say that when the children from those families came into the clinic, they didn't come in very often. But when they did come in, they had very high treatment needs. And so my colleague, this was just a chat in our staff meeting, and my colleague, Professor Elizabeth Waters, said, oh, we've got to look into this. This sounds like something important. We need to learn more about it. And so we embarked on a study we called Teeth Tales. And it, we didn't know it then, but it became a nine-year study with multiple phases. And our first step was learning about what are sociocultural differences in beliefs and practices around child oral health. And it was incredibly informative for us. And I'll share just a, a few of the things that came through. One of them was that many of the families did not use toothpaste because they assumed that it wasn't halal because it had gelatin in it. And of course, toothpaste is halal, um, but many families were not comfortable using it. We also found that families were not concerned about the state of the, the primary dentition because it fell out, so you didn't have to worry about it. And so without that understanding of how it affects child, children's health and well-being, um, and the fact that it's also uh, such a, a clear risk factor for the state of their adult teeth. So we also talked to them about accessing health services and as been, has been mentioned previously, there was a lot of confusion about just how the health system worked and how they would engage with that. There was concern about the extensive waiting list, which was quite legitimate. Um, in relation to our community dental clinics, although they didn't realise that those who had, um, you know, refugee or migrant background were likely to be eligible to be on the priority list. There was concerns about cost, but once again, they didn't realise that the children would be treated for free. And there were also concerns about discrimination because they really didn't know quite how to negotiate the appointment system and, and so on. And so some of our families who were able to visit their home country were waiting till they went home to visit the dentist back in their home country. And that was particularly true of the families from a Pakistani background where they'd come across as skilled migrants. So these were families who had, you know, were, were well educated. We also found, and this was really in our piloting of a potential intervention for teeth tails, that while the families who have just arrived are the ones who probably need it the most to, to link them in with the health systems and so on, they were the hardest to engage with because, of course, they're dealing with those 
priority settlement issues, finding somewhere permanent to live, getting a driver's licence, getting work, um, and so on. And so, and the other thing was that many of, because, you know, as, as has been discussed, you get different waves of migration, the most recent waves don't have their own cultural organisations in place to act as, a, as a, an intermediary. And so it's very difficult to, to connect. These were some of our peer educators at our pilot with um, my colleague Coralie there, the one with the white hair. She was a beautiful connector. So I guess the question is, what can we do to promote good child oral health? And I certainly don't have all the answers, as I know you won't expect me to, um, but I'll just share with you some of our experiences. The, if I could do one thing where I thought it would make a difference, it would be to just get rid of sweet drinks, because it is coming up as a predictor in every study that we do, including those with our families from refugee and migrant background. Sometimes it's the, um, the soft drinks, sometimes it's, it's sugars and honeys added to drinks um, and given on spoons to children when they go to bed, sweet drinks in the bottle when they're settled for sleep and so on. So, oh my goodness, can we just deal with these sweet drinks? And it was fabulous to hear that, um, that you've got a policy here with the sweet drink tax. The other thing that we're finding, you know how when we talk about healthy eating and, and any sort of health behaviours, we see a social gradient. We know that um, you know, parent education is a real factor, social disadvantage is, a, is, a, is another risk factor. In, a, in our recent studies with our birth cohorts looking at infant diets, we're finding that that certainly holds true in terms of um, consumption of healthy foods and drinks but the discretionary foods and drinks are consistent across the social gradient. And so what that's telling us is that it's become a social norm, that it's seen as completely reasonable to be giving your, your infant child food that they don't need to eat, introduce them to soft drinks perhaps, um, when they're not even asking for it. There's no pester power. You have, you, know, you have complete control over what they're consuming at this age and you're influencing the development of their tastes. So this is a real concern to us and um, we think it's, the, you know, it's one of the new intervention points that we need to be looking at in the Australian context. The other thing that's concerning me about this pouch food, and even the, the word, the, the name bothers me, <laughs> Um, is that for these families who have adopted this, this pouch food because it's so convenient when they're out and about with their infants, you can be absolutely sure they're going to be looking for it to put in the, the lunchbox when these children get to school. And then, of course, when their teenagers are heading off to sport, grab a pouch and take it with you. So you can just see it's, it, you know, it's, it's on a generational trend. And um, I'd be advocating to... Let's see if we can do something about that because who knows what's going to be in those pouches as it, as it spreads as well. Uh, our, our research is showing that those first five years of settlement are the, the highest risk in terms of child oral health. Um, it's a bit complicated though. So we know that you know, when families are first arrived, it's also the hardest point to, to um, work with them in terms of health promotion. And we also found for, for the population that we were working with, after 15 years of settlement, the benefits weren't evident. And so we had a close look at that to work out what we think was going on. And we actually had three different ethnicities represented in our study. And that was because they just matched the settlement pattern in the area we were working in. One was families from, as I said, Pakistan, from Pakistan. So they'd predominantly come across as skilled migrants. There was families from Iraq who had come across um, predominantly on humanitarian visas, so they were more recent arrivals. And families from Lebanon who had arrived and they were sort of more um, second, third generation families um, who had arrived in Australia about 15 years ago or more. And, um, and 
they would have come, prob probably many of them on family visas. So different profiles, and I, I, I expect that that didn't give us the same level of power to detect difference in our study, but it was really interesting seeing the different patterns for those different profiles, which was our intent, of course. And what we think is the case for this group of families who'd come with a Lebanese background was that they were families who had come from quite poor circumstances with low education in their home country. And when they arrived in Australia, at the time, the policies for supporting migrants were not good. And we're not good at the moment, I can tell you that. But, um, and so that's reflected in how they have fared even in successive generations. So the, the influence of the policies um, for refugee migrants are incredibly important in that regard. So, um, can I just do a time check? Because the clock is masked. What time is it now? Thank you. Okay, so when we're looking at interventions, I'm a public health researcher, so I like to go back to, you know, what I consider the Bible, if, please no religious offence, in health promotion terms, um, just as a guide for multi-level interventions. And of course, it's influenced so many different frameworks that we work off today. And it's telling us that we need to think about not just personal skills and knowledge, but what's the policy environment? Can we create supportive environments? Can we engage community in the decision making about change so that there's buy-in and, and it's sustainable? Certainly we need to be developing personal skills and knowledge and thinking about reorienting the health service in, in whatever context we're working to, to maximise um, the engagement of the clients that we're, we're targeting. So that's just the background to what I'm, I'm now going to present. One of the things that we worked on in the teeth tail study in the, in the full trial of the, of the intervention was to start with the organisations who were involved in delivering the services, to say, well, OK, what's our cultural framework? And this has been the most useful thing for me in engaging in this sort of work is to just recognise that, yes, there is a cultural framework influencing what I'm doing as well. And I know that sounds pretty obvious to all of you here, but when you are the kind of the, the mainstream population and you're dealing with families who come from a minority group, it's easy to think, well, they do it differently. But we just do it differently from each other. And so there's no reason why we can't stop and go, well, hang on a minute, can we do what we do differently to make it more accessible for them? And that's the, the starting point. So we developed this tool which I wouldn't suggest is, you know, the gold standard. It was a work in progress, but it was quite useful for us and we now, it is now available to anyone to use through our Australian Centre for Culture, Ethnicity and Health. So in the clinical context, some of the things that we were, our partners were thinking about was the system for making appointments. You know, they're often trying to streamline the system so there's really only one entry point. But if that one entry point is really not easy for someone to use who, one, doesn't know how to find it or two, can't speak the language, you need to have multiple entry points. And so this was something that we were, were raising. The appointment format is really important. In the clinical context, certainly in Australia, people are seen as individuals. They have to make an appointment given a certain time. Um, my colleagues at North Richmond Community Health, just so fabulous in this space, but they, as a matter of course, were, were making appointments for family groups and they would see them all together. They would have open clinic days where people could just rock up without having to make an appointment and trying to work with patterns that people were more familiar with. With Teeth Tales, we, we used a, an outreach process of screenings. When we first recruited families, we did a, a screening as part of our research assessment, but also as a, an initial um, service point. And it, so we went to where the families were, and that was incredibly helpful in connecting with families who had not engaged with the health service at all previously. We were at playgroups, at kindergartens, at immunisation days, um, and at cultural organisations, services. And, um, and that was a fabulous 
process and so much so that it has is being continued now by our community health partners just as a as as a part of their service now in getting this up anyone who's been involved in community based research i'm sure will agree with me that it's really messy you know you don't just go in and go right we're going to do this and here we go it's you know it's a process of negotiation and trial and error and a lot of people going no i'm sorry that's just not going to work or yeah, but, and, and this is what we were getting. And one of the issues was that the dental service couldn't see how they could do these screenings out in community because how did they charge for it? Not the patient, but, you know, in the system. How did they code it so they got funded? And so luckily I was able to connect them with a partner who was very strategic in managing the system. Um, he, he ran a dental service in another location and he rang them for me and said, this is how I code it and, and I have received the funding, I can guarantee it will work. And as soon as that came through, that was the breakthrough. The dental service was on board, keen, loved it. They just needed to know how to code it. Um, and the other thing that one of our partners has put in place, Martin Hall, and, and that's not the Hall of the Hall technique, um, a different Martin, which I didn't know, I used to credit him with it. <laughs> but um, he just applied a health promotion framework to the clinical, um, to the clinic, where he approached it as a shared responsibility model. So there's no point treating a patient if they're not taking care of their teeth when they're at home. And often they didn't know how to do that. So he has this system now when they arrive, they have an initial assessment, a triage process. Obviously, if they're at extreme risk, they need immediate treatment. But otherwise, they have an assessment not just on the, the state of their teeth, but on, the, on their oral health behaviours. And if they are not engaging in good oral health behaviours, they take a pathway where they spend time with an oral health educator, so a dental therapist, to learn those behaviours and have those in place before they have the treatment so they can get the best results. And it's meant he's had to really look at the balance of his workforce to, al to align with that, but it's working beautifully and we're, we're conducting an evaluation, including a health economic evaluation of that. So there's a paper on that if people are interested. But in terms of community interventions, I, I can only say to you, unless you are incredibly multi-skilled and multi-connected, just, just bring in the partners, you know? Don't try and do everything, just say, what do you need to do this well? Okay, we need someone who's connected to this, this cultural group, bring in the cultural organisation. We need the expertise in the community sector, bring in the local government, the community health, and so on. And this is what we did when we engaged with Teeth Tales. We had fabulous partners, but, you know, it's not always smooth sailing. I did spend one Christmas Eve negotiating between two partners who were saying, well, if they stay in, I'm pulling out. And I thought that my Christmas was going to be pretty miserable, but we got there. Um, so, you know, that's just the reality. You have, to, you have to take into account what they're dealing with and what they need from the study to proceed. So our intervention in the community was through peer educators. We trained up peer educators to deliver a community oral health program to families. And um, the woman in the leopard skin print there is the peer educator, and this is at the premises of, of the Arabic social services. And it was very hands-on, as you can see. We had, I can tell you, it was really hard to get parents to come. That's just the reality. People are busy and they don't quite see the point of it. When they came, they loved it and they came back for the next sessions. But it was very hard to engage them and we weren't the ones engaging them. It was, it was peer educators from their own cultural background and connected to them through social networks. So it is really difficult and if I was doing it again, I would probably structure it a bit differently so that it was running at programs that are already in place that parents are attending. So at the local kindergarten, this, at this organisation they found they had some success when they were offering other services on site and families kind of made the most of both of them. But they did find that more fathers turned up, which is really unusual, I assume, here as well. It's usually the mothers turn up to, to things around about the children and um, there was more engagement of fathers in these programs. So about 16% of the parents were fathers. 
So the messages that were being taught were eat well, drink well, clean well and stay well and finished with a visit to the clinic so that families could see what's involved, how to make appointments, what to expect when you came and, um, and that worked really well. So only about half of our families who were allocated to intervention received the intervention and those who didn't turn up we sent them oral health information packs and they also received their toothbrush and toothpaste pack uh, and our results showed a clear difference between the outcomes for those families versus those that attended the sessions but of course those that attended would have been more motivated as well. I really think that when we're thinking about oral health interventions there's a lot we can learn from experiences in the obesity prevention sector. And these are some of the things that came out of our school-based obesity prevention studies that I felt may be relevant. The first was in the school context where families are fasting for Ramadan or avoiding particular foods for Halal, the school's not always dealing with that well. And they sometimes need some guidance on how to manage that. Even though these are young children who don't need to observe these practices, they often choose to be as part of their religious development. And one of the really valuable things that we were able to provide to families was what foods can be provided to children that will be sustainable throughout the day. So they're not looking at high sugar um, at the beginning, at the end of the day, sort of high sugar options, but actually understanding how food behaves over the course of a, of a day of fasting. Um, when we gave children the choices, particularly when we're thinking about menu, you know, the canteen menu options and teachers and parents were saying no because the kids just won't buy those things so we asked the children to select the new menu and then of course you not only engage the children but you overcome those parent, adult barriers. We found that when there was resistance to change, where the principal said from the start of next year we will be implementing these changes they were implemented much more smoothly than when they tried to bring them in throughout the school year and when they were decisive, clear changes rather than little bits here and there. And the drink water policy was the easiest policy to introduce. You, you promote clear, clear bottles with water in them um, to, to try and get rid of the juice and the, and the soft drinks. And they were really successful, particularly the schools where they had an art project to come up with the logo and had special water bottles made up for the school. Uh, and also just allow for generational shift because people do resist. Parents do like to give treats to their children. Um, they're suspicious sometimes of, of schools and, and other organisations having a say in what happens and so they can resist but the reality is their children grow up and they move on and the next cohort coming through don't know any different. So you've just got to hang in there and allow for the, the years it takes for, a, for um, a new wave of families coming through. So just have a breather, give you a breather. <laughs> I also know that many of you are engaging in research so I thought it might be helpful just to hear some of the, the insights we gained, some of the surprises we had in doing our research. Uh, the first look was about study design. For teeth tiles it was really hard to come up with a rigorous study design that still fit the reality of the way the health service operated and the cultural organisations operated because really our health organisations were locationally based whereas our cultural organisations were really servicing families across the metropolitan area. So in thinking about who's our intervention group, who's our comparison group, you know, what's the reality of that? It was, it was challenging but we ended up deciding that we couldn't do a random allocation, we couldn't do matched location comparison. What we did do was say that people who were within reach of the intervention program were intervention and everyone else was comparison. So it's not an orthodox study design but it was it fit the reality and we were aiming for sustainability. The culturally competent approach I've already spoken about, being reflective about our own methods and, um, and reviewing that. It was interesting, one of our earlier PhD candidates, Alicia Riggs, 
conducted a systematic review of studies of um, child oral health in migrant populations. And, and certainly she found that children in these families were at higher risk, but when she looked at the methods of the different studies, she was a little horrified to find what methods they used to determine ethnicity, because so many of them looked at the patient coming in and ticked the box that they thought matched. Which if you're doing any sort of research on determining ethnicity, you just, you know, you clearly wouldn't do that. So, so just, you know, have a critical eye when you're looking at studies and be mindful yourself. It's really hard to work out the best indicator. And certainly we found that even when we were asking a series of questions around country of birth and language spoken at home and so on, um, women in some communities assumed the cultural identity of their husband. So they would tell you one ethnicity, but in actual fact, they'd been brought up in another um, cultural framework. So quite tricky. The other thing we found was, you know, repeat surveys, standard part of our research method to get pre and post measures. We had this, um, for a short time, one of our research assistants was a woman who'd come from, from Africa and she was saying to us, oh, so you're going to do repeat surveys? And we said, yes, because it's, you know, it's a longitudinal study. And she said, Right, she said, well, you realise that when you go back to those families, they're going to assume if you're asking them to do it again, that they must have got their answers wrong the first time. So they better answer differently this time. And so we were just like, well, that had never occurred to us. And thank goodness you told us that because we had to be really careful in explaining the reason we were coming back to, to ask them these questions again. Uh, and look, and this is another, just a small point, but in the community screenings with quite small children, we used lap-to-lap -lap screenings. So I don't know if you're, you're using them here. Um, and, it, you know, it's quite lovely. They sit on their parents' lap and lean back. But, of course, the older children, they think they can sit up. So they were hopping up onto their mother's lap. And in the pilot study, the... The, um, the dental practitioner was kind of obliging and would look in the child's mouth, but of course didn't have the same view of the child's mouth. And in terms of calibration, that was a real issue. So it's so important to do the pilots and be knowing that, that that had been an issue in the pilot, in the actual trial, we had the researcher standing with the families who were about to have the screening and explaining to them very carefully the position that was required and that this was important. So they were primed before they, they presented. And look, the other thing that I would just recommend is, this, this is a model, I'll explain it first. Um, my colleague Nina Wallerstein, who is actually um, a US-based um, researcher, very well, regard, well known and highly regarded in community-based participatory research. And she's developed this model with her colleagues around the conversations you have with your partners before you engage in, in a collaborative process. And we actually came across this at the end of the study and, um, and I had a chat with Nina about it, so we, we did it at the end. And basically you talk together about, well, what is the context that we're in? Because each of the partners will have a slightly different perspective on that. So you, you identify what are the features of the context that you're in and then you talk quite frankly about the partnerships because some of you will have been working together for some years, others will be new, There'll be tension between others. Some are more bureaucratic, others are pretty relaxed. Just get that out there and, and be clear about it. Be very clear on what the research or the project is trying to do. And I think, to be honest, that the last circle is the most important. So the conversation we have is, if you're going to be part of this, what makes it worth it for you? If you have to justify an afternoon out of your day you know, every fortnight to come to one of these meetings, how, how can you make sure that this is relevant to your organisation and the outcomes that you're seeking? And so as a result, we not only had, a, you know, sort of our contribution to the evidence about the difference that the Teeth Tales intervention study made, but we had a whole range of different outcomes for across the different sectors, including some um, 
products and materials that our partners are still using today. I do have a couple of these reports here today, if anybody was interested. These were prepared for a non-academic and non-clinical audience because we like to make sure we're, we're sharing our findings more widely than, than just the academic journals. And of course I do need to acknowledge that I've drawn from a whole range of studies here and this is only some of the partners in the oral health um, sector of, of my research. Um, so I do, do certainly want to acknowledge all of them. Thank you. What was your study and what was the outcomes? Uh, I know it was oral health literacy, but I must have missed something. Yeah, look, and I, I understand why you missed it. I'm, I did make a choice today not to present a series of studies in a linear fashion because I know um, from Ben that, that um, the reason I was asked was because people had accessed our research papers on the study. And so instead I chose to share some of our experiences in conducting the research. But um, the, the three oral health studies that I was drawing from was Teeth Tales, which was the nine-year study I spoke of that had the initial qualitative stage and the pilot and then an intervention trial to promote child oral health in families with a refugee migrant background. And then some of the other learnings around infant oral health were drawn from two birth cohort studies from, with children from zero to five years old, one of which was called Vic Gen and the other which was called Splash. You are very After lucky. Oh, look, I, I'm certainly not saying they can, can't eat any, um, but it's, it's understanding that it's a sometimes food and not an everyday food. I had, I had an experience where um, I was talking to someone who worked in the health sector and she was annoyed because her children at kindergarten were being, she was being told what, that she couldn't put lollies in her, the lunchbox to take you know, at a child's kindergarten. And I explained to her that there were new regulations that the kindergartens had to follow. And she was annoyed. She goes, yes, but I understand it's sometimes food. She said, I just give them a sweet after every meal. And I was thinking, well, that's not my understanding of sometimes food. <laughs> that's, that sounds like three times a day food to me. So, so there, you know, it is about understanding about amounts and how often and also how to care for your teeth after you've eaten those foods. Um, Melbourne's a pretty diverse city. How did you decide which populations to study for the pilot qualitative? Uh, we, well, we did. So our pilot was based in North Richmond, which is an area which has a lot of um, public housing, high-rise public housing. And so we looked at what, were the, what was the current settlement of of new arrivals in that area, particularly of communities that had very young children because we were looking at the zero to five age range and the same in the Moreland area, which is where we ran the intervention component of our trial. Um, we looked at the settlement data there. So in North Richmond, we were working with families from Vietnamese, Oromo and Sudanese backgrounds. And in the Moreland area, it was families from Iraq, Pakistan and Lebanon. Um, I wanted to ask you what uh, people came up with t for this buy-in from children to make um, healthy choices like pleasant or m to be motivated and even home, home oral health care like to make it fun and, or a game or do you have some ideas about that? Uh, yeah, look, in the, in the school-based context, um, the food choices there were a couple of things that happened that, you know, it varied across the schools, but there was a local food supplier that was providing food for the school canteen. And can I just note that in Australia, um, you know, the majority of families will send their children to school with their lunch in a, in a lunchbox and they'll have a canteen for snacks or for the, for the days when children don't have lunch. So they're not given a standard meal every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, their local provider 
was giving them pies and sausage rolls and, and that sort of thing. And so they went to the local provider to say, can you do healthier options? And they said, yes, we'd love to. We can make homemade zucchini slice and we can make quiche and we can make, you know, they had some really fabulous suggestions. Um, and so they had a taste testing at the school where they provided all of the different products and the children went along and tasted them and voted. Okay. And, um, and so that's how they changed the menu, which was fantastic. At another school, they actually came at it from a completely different angle. They were starting to talk about the environment and, and the, the environment of the school. And there was a whole lot of rubbish on the playground uh, after lunch. And the cleaner at the end of the day would go around the school and there'd be like eight rubbish bins overflowing. So the school introduced what they called nude food days where families had to send the food in the lunchbox without any packaging. And so it just kind of forced their hand a little, you know, that most of the, the food in the lunch boxes was fresh food. I mean, you still, you still got the occasional parent who emptied a packet of chips into the lunch box, but, <laughs> but they were fortunately rare. So they introduced this change and it was completely successful uh, in terms of the rubbish. By the end of the day, the, the cleaner emptied all the rubbish bins and it only amounted to a half a bin compared to what had been eight overflowing bins. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was changing what was in the lunch boxes as well without even talking about health, which you know, can be a bit boring sometimes. So it's nice to come at it from a different angle. So we have one last keynote speaker today, and to introduce her, I'd like to call up to the podium uh, Dr. Kristen Hoft. So I'm delighted to introduce Nancy Burke to you all. She's a professor of anthropology and also professor and chair of public health at University of California Merced um, in Central Valley here. She is one of the things that she does is developing a public health PhD program at UC Merced. She's building a new generation of public health researchers and practitioners who have the skills and experience to improve health in California's Central Valley and beyond. While she's recruiting, teaching, and mentoring this promising generation of public health specialists, she is also the co-director of the UC Cuba Academic Initiative she serves on the UC Global Health Institute Board of Directors, leads the Health Equity Research Group at UC Merced, and continues her work here where she's at UCSF as faculty in the Department of Anthropology, History, and Social Medicine, and also the UCSF Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. So she has a lot going on. And also what she does a lot of is research. She has produced an extraordinary body of research using in-depth ethnographic and qualitative methods as well as mixed methods to understand complex systems and personal experiences around health. In particular, she has worked with immigrant and vulnerable populations around cancer disparities and structural vulnerability, cancer and chronic disease in a global context, um, one example is she has collaborated for a very long time at the Universidad de Ciencias Médicas, Facultad Giron in Havana, Cuba, for nearly 10 years around chronic disease self-management in Cuban communities. And she also has researched health literacy and navigation of health systems in the U.S. safety net system, and this research has included oral health literacy among Mexican immigrants here in California including bringing attention and resources to understand uh, traditionally underserved and under-researched Central Valley, where she's now at UC Merced. She brings her expertise in community-based partnership, health literacy, and working with diverse immigrant populations to the field of oral health. She has a particular skill for integrating medical anthropology, methodology, and theory into public health, and biomedical domains, which enhances all of those disciplines in the process. 
Her intelligence and talent make her a delight to work with, and I'm really excited to introduce her to all of you guys today. I've just, I mean, I've just learned so much from the talk so far, and the last, uh, the two keynotes together really made me think about um, one of the experiences I had when I was first um, finishing graduate school, and I was working with the Refugee and Immigrant Health Promotion Program in Seattle, Washington, um, which was associated with the Harborview uh, Medical Center and the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. And I was working on a study of um, cervical cancer and hepatitis B in Vietnamese and Cambodian refugee populations and worked with a pretty diverse team of um, researchers. And one of my colleagues had, she was from Cambodia and she lived with her parents um, and she had a couple of young children in the household and she was having to miss work quite a bit because her young children were constantly having to go to the dentist. And when she told me this, this story, I, I just couldn't figure out what was going I, you know, I asked, what, why, why are they you know, having to go to the dentist so much? And she said, well, their teeth are rotting. And this is a very well-educated um, woman. And I asked, well, what, what's going on? And she said, well, the problem is, is that you know, my parents survived the Khmer Rouge. And these are their grandchildren. And they want to keep them happy. And they're the ones taking care of my kids. So they're constantly giving them sweets. And I can't ask them to stop because it's so meaningful to them. So I just to offer that as an example, again, of context and why it matters. When I was preparing for this talk, I, ta I looked at the um, oral health atlas, um, which was developed by the uh, World Dental Federation with support from the WHO and IADR. Um, and it, the atlas argues that oral health is um, one of the most neglected areas of global health. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm getting my slides messed up here. Um, sorry, I'm trying to get to the notes, but they're not working here. Okay got it, that um, oral health is one of the most neglected areas of, of oral health, despite the fact that 90% 90 of, 90 of people have had dental problems um, and that, uh, that are caused by toothache or caries, and 15% have experienced periodontal disease. And oral cancer, they point out, is the eighth um, most common cancer worldwide and the most common in men in Southeast Asia. In the Philippines, just as an example, 97% of children um, of six-year-olds have dental caries, and we know that that's a, a, a large issue across, across the world. Um, and we know that early childhood caries have developmental effects, so these children are experiencing um, potential um, uh, pain and sepsis, uh, can affect sleep, social interactions, nutrition, um, all, all kinds of issues. Also, access to oral health care is a major problem across the globe. Um, for example, Germany and the UK have one dentist per um, 1,000 in the population, whereas lower, low income and middle income countries have um, one per 50,000 people. But in some sub Saharan African countries, the ratio is only one per 900,000 people. So, a wide range of stratified care. The Atlas makes a strong case for the problem and links this directly with the solutions of appropriate behavior, such as oral hygiene. Reinforced by public health policies and health promotion, universal access to fluoride, widespread use of fluoride toothpaste, um, access to modern dental treatment, and increasing the oral health workforce. And while all of these approaches are important and have been shown um, to increase the prevention of oral diseases and also to decrease the burden of oral diseases in certain populations, I'd like to push us today to think beyond these individual level and um, pragmatic system level interventions to the social determinants that might actually undermine their effectiveness when they are implemented. So today I'd like to talk with you about the growing recognition among public health researchers that immigration should be considered a social determinant of public health. 
and the growing evidence base for this assertion. And then I'd like to talk about um, the connections between immigration policy and oral health, particularly in the United States. And in talking about this, I'm going to draw on some ethnographic examples from some research that um, I and colleagues, including Dr. Heff, have conducted in California um, to illustrate with some on the ground, or as anthropologists like to say, experience near examples. Um, and I'll leave with some thoughts on what taking immigration seriously as a social determinant of health might mean um, and might demand of us as researchers and providers. And I'm using the United States as a case example here um, because global health is global. It means here as well as there. Um, and especially working in the Central Valley, I can tell you here is where we're seeing global health as well. And it's also to point out that the policy environment and the context that I'm going to be talking about here in the United States, um, that it's, it's to highlight that I think the same kind of lens should be taken in other places in thinking about the ways that policy can influence oral health. So immigration policy in the U.S., scholars have argued, um, creates a form of structural stigma um, that undermines immigrant access to and engagement with health care. And this is just one of a myriad um, number of examples from the New York Times and other publications about how immigrants are foregoing medical care due to uh, the current uh, climate. Just as an example, there was a, uh, a survey that was conducted in Texas of a series of migrant clinics that found that the um, clinics were seeing a, a, a real spike in no-shows. And when they surveyed the, um, their patients, they found that many parents were unwilling to take their children to the clinic because while their child might be documented, they weren't. Um, and they were also unwilling to purchase or, or sign their children up for insurance, even if they were eligible, because that would require them to uh, record their residence and also provide some economic information that they were concerned about. So that um, undermined access to care. So this concept of structural stigma um, has been kind of purported by uh, Bruce Link and Mark Hatzenbuehler, and it refers to the societal level conditions, cultural norms, and institutional policies that constrain the opportunities, resources, and well-being of the stigmatized. Um, immigration policies create a stigmatized environment that produces ongoing fear of deportation, exclusion from healthcare resources due to unauthorized status, and use of informal or non-medical sources of care. Now, before introducing some of the epidemiological research that has linked this stigmatized environment to adverse health outcomes across the country, I just want to take a moment to talk about um, some of the policies that have informed this environment. So some uh, scholars have argued that the unauthorized population was actually created in this country in, in 1882 with the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And then it grew after 1924 when the U.S. enacted um, the uh, immigration restrictions and established the border control. And at this time is when they also made entry without inspection sufficient grounds for deportation. Um, the illegal category was further con consolidated in 1965 um, and continued through 1968 and into 1976 when the U.S. ended the Bracero, uh, Bracero um, guest worker program with Mexico while also imposing limits on the numbers of immigrants um, that could enter the country from Western Hemisphere nations. And these policy shifts really influence the entrance of um, migrants from uh, primarily Latin America uh, in, with unauthorized status. So, and then we have Bill Clinton. Um, so an important subsequent act which presages divisions that were uh, furthered by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, is the 1996 Personal Responsibility Work and Opportunity um, and, re I'm sorry, Personal Responsibility Work Opportunity and Reconciliation Act. Um, and this act imposed citizenship requirements and limits on legal residency in order to restrict access for legal permanent residents and um, unauthorized residents 
to federally funded health care programs, including Medicaid, Medicare, um, and the Children's Health Insurance Program. So these restrictions really shifted the responsibility um, for health care for undocumented and legal permanent residents from the federal level to the states um, and local governments. And most states provide medical assistance only to unauthorized children and pregnant women. So there's a window when um, unauthorized women can get access to care, and it's when they're pregnant. Um, and in some of my research, it became very clear that that was really the only time that women were accessing care. Only 19 states uh, provide some form of medical assistance regardless of immigration status. So many argue that California, even though we are now one of the most inclusive states, that um, we're kind of, we set the foundation for that 1996 act, right? So um, California's Proposition 187, the Save Our State Act, which was designed to prohibit undocumented immigrants from accessing education, social services, and health care, um, passed by a wide margin, but obviously later it was found unconstitutional. Uh, many argue that this paved the way for that 19, uh, the federal um, welfare reform law passed in 1996. So the Affordable Care Act, um, which as many of you know, expanded the federal Medicaid program and it offers subsidized health insurance and created health insurance exchange marketplaces um, where moderate income individuals could purchase private private insurance on their own or with federally subsidized tax credits also um, created further divisions um, because the only group, oops, I'm sorry. Eh. The only group that was completely excluded from this were the undocumented. So, um, get back over here okay at the same time that these changes were occurring my mouse is going all over the place here at the same time that these changes were occurring deportations of unauthorized immigrants have um, been on a steady rise President Obama received the moniker um, deport, uh, deporter in chief um, for the unprecedented numbers of unauthorized Im immigrants deported under his administration, so uh, over 400,000 in the year 200, 2012 alone. Um, since the new administration has come into uh, power in, since uh, in, in 2017, um, there were over um, 34,000 um, individuals uh, deported between, um, uh, in the first, I think it was eight months of the, uh, of the uh, administration. And importantly, uh, a, a major shift happened between the two administrations in terms of the prioritization for deportations. So under President Obama, there, those who were prioritized for deportation were those who had recently entered the country without authorization or were in the country without authorization and had committed a violent crime. Under the current administration, prioritization is generalized to being in this country without authorization. So deportation threat is um, something that has become equalized. Um, okay. So, uh, I think I have, I talked over these slides already. So, um, so many of us are familiar with Arizona's uh, Senate Bill 1070, which made failure to possess immigration documents um, a crime and expanded police power to detain persons suspected of being in the U.S. illegally. Um, but fewer of us may be aware of what's happening in other states. So um, some of the other states that have passed copycat um, omnibus anti-immigrant legislation are in are Georgia, Atlanta, um, for example. Um, so I'd like to highlight a couple of examples from states that both have passed that legislation and then some that have not. Um, to exemplify the um, pervasive nature of this policy environment. Uh, okay. And um, the implications that these social processes have for health. 
So William Lopez and colleagues um, recently studied the health implications of an immigration raid that was um, conducted in Michigan, a state that has not passed an omnibus anti-immigration law. Um, and this raid was a pretty heavily militarized raid. It was um, the sheriff's department um, collaborated with a uh, SWAT team to go into a two-story building that um, the bottom was a mechanic shop and the top um, had been uh, made into a residence. And um, there were several men and women and young children in the residence when the uh, um, law enforcement arrived. Um, and the reason why they used the SWAT team apparently was because they believed there might be firearms or drugs in the building. So the, when the agents arrived, they um, broke through the door, they pushed through the door, broke the lock, and um, held everyone at gunpoint and made them lay on the ground, um, including women who were holding children. And so multiple men were detained and later deported. And these researchers took advantage of the fact that this uh, pretty militarized raid happened in the middle of a community survey that they were conducting, uh, in which they had recruited a population-based sample of Latino immigrants. And in this study, they found that uh, the post-raid completion, so they had the pre and post, and the post-raid completion was associated with higher levels of immigration enforcement stress and lower uh, self-rated health scores. It's not surprising. But. Um, Nicole Novak and Arlene Geronimus um, and colleagues similarly took advantage of a 2008 immigration raid in, um, a meat, at a meat processing plant in Postville, Iowa, to compare the before and after um, effects on low birth weight among foreign-born and U.S.-born Latina mothers. So this was uh, a, a pretty dramatic raid. At this time in 2008, it was the largest immigration raid um, perpetrated at, in the U.S. And, I mean, it was big. There were 900 officers. Um, there were um, uh, 900 agents, including armed officers and a Black Hawk helicopter. Um, they arrested 389 employees, and um, about 98% of them were Latino. And while they were, when they entered the plant, um, they asked for self-reported ethnicity, and um, those who stated let, that they were Latino were held in handcuffs until their documentation status could be ascertained or verified. Um, the, um, the men were taken to a facility about 80 miles away and held, and then uh, the women were held in the county jails, except for those who were mothers of young children, and they were allowed to go home with um, ankle bracelets. Um, but because their husbands, brothers, uncles um, had been detained and they themselves could no longer work, they were in a pretty dire situation once they were at home um, in terms of feeding their children. Um, and so when they were arraigned, the detainees were chained together and arraigned in groups, and about 297 of them were deported. So I give you these details, after, and this was after serving a five-month uh, prison sentence. And I give you these details just because it was in the, um, it, it was a big deal. So it was in the public consciousness in Iowa um, at the time. So, uh, what Novak, Geronimus, and colleagues did was they looked at birth registry data, um, pre and post um, raid. And they found that rates of low birth weight were steady among white and Latina mothers in the two years preceding the raid, but that rates of low birth weight rose only among Latina, both foreign and U.S. born mothers after the raid. And they associate this, um, uh, this finding with previous research that was conducted by Diane uh, Lauderdale um, after 9-11 uh, in 2001, where um, Lauderdale looked at low birth weight in California pre and post 9-11 among women who had Arabic sounding last names and saw an increase in low birth weight among those women. And the point being that these were events that happened across the country, but the 
effects on individuals who are um, assumed to have shared ethnicity with those who are targeted uh, are felt, that there are health effects for these individuals. So the last example I'll give is Nolan Klein, who is a medical anthropologist uh, working in Atlanta, Georgia, documents what he calls the pathogenic effects of um, House Bill 87, which is a Georgia policy modeled after Arizona's Senate Bill 1070 that similarly requires immigrants to carry proof of legal status. And HB 87 also criminalized um, assistance offered to unauthorized immigrants, including transporting immigrants um, or unauthorized individuals in a vehicle or providing non-emergency health care using public funds. So this extended the criminalization beyond the individuals themselves to faith leaders, to friends, to um, health care providers. Um, and what Klein found was that the fear of being arrested transformed immigrants' behaviors, including reducing engagements in exercise in public um, spaces, deciding appropriate times to seek care. So um, if any of you have ever been to Georgia, you know that there is not the best public transportation system, so people have to drive. So unauthorized immigrants cannot have a driver's license in Georgia, so driving to get care put them at risk. So people were making decisions on behalf of themselves and their children um, w based on this fear of potentially being arrested. Um, also, um, Lat La these Latinos also reported um, seeking out what were called Latino clinics. So non-medical, non uh, unauthorized sources of care um, that, um, you know, it was just unclear of the quality, I guess. And as one of his informants uh, stated, you may pay more and they may not give you the right medicine, but you know it's safe. Um, so this research illustrates um, the fact that, you know, the stigmatized environment or the structural stigma, as, um, as Link and Hatzenbuehler would state, created by deportation threat and, the, and our immigration laws in this country has health effects and that these effects are not limited to the unauthorized but rather impact those who share ethnicity with the targeted. And in this sense, illegality is becoming racialized. Um, and that the effects are also not geographically bounded. So what does this have to do with oral health, you're wondering? <laughs> um, well, uh, some of the Latino clinics mentioned in um, Nolan Klein's study were actually dental clinics. So um, one of his participants who worked with um, an immigrant organization in Georgia um, stated, instead of going to a dentist, some undocumented immigrants go to somebody with a chair at home. I've done it myself. I had a tooth fixed, he had a chair, there was a drill, and everything. It's just like being in an office, except it's in their dining room or on their porch. So people are seeking out dental care in these informal um, contexts. And also, deportation threat has been linked explicitly to dental care. In February 2018, border agents detained um, a 40-year-old undocumented immigrant a dairy worker originally from Mexico shortly after he came out of this dentist's office in Vermont. And if you read the stories about this, apparently the border agents were actually waiting in the um, parking lot of the dentist's office. So even though they're instructed not to go to these kinds of sensitive places, they are. And knowledge of this has had a chilling effect on um, the proximity to care. And, and people actually accessing care. So this, this story is about a dental clinic in Texas where they're actually doing an incredible amount of outreach to the community, including creating a, um, a YouTube video about how long they've been serving immigrants in their community and the kinds of questions and information that they're gonna ask of people and how they're gonna um, safeguard their information because they want people to continue to come in to, to um, receive care, and it has, these kinds of stories have had a chilling effect. So, um, in our own research, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, we observed and documented impacts of these exclusionary policies on women and children's oral health. 
Um, we conducted a three-year study of oral health literacy among Mexican immigrant um, families living in the East Bay. Um, and this included clinic observations, in-depth qualitative interviews with 30 caregivers, mainly mothers and grandmothers, um, of children five and under, and interviews with oral health providers and staff. And this is just, you can see some of the demographics. And the interviews we conducted with caregivers provided insight into the challenges that unauthorized and immigrant um, families were facing in accessing dental care, as well as the confusion caused by mixed status within families. Um, some of this was due to language. Parents were told that they could not accompany their children back um, into the exam room and when, the, when they didn't speak and when they didn't speak English, they felt disempowered to kind of to ask and to figure out how to get back there um, or to insist. So as this mother stated, I wasn't able, talking about her young son, I was not able to go in with him. You wait outside and they just take him in and the treatment took many hours. It was a lot of time and a lot of desperation because we didn't know how he was. That was another of the challenges. Since I didn't speak the language, most of the communication was with my husband, so I didn't know what was going on. Um, similar to Nolan Klein's findings in Atlanta, uh, participants in our study also visited um, informal or unauthorized dental practitioners. And uh, also a number of them returned to Mexico for care as well, um, which is a common um, practice. A caregiver who had never seen a dentist in Mexico um, prior to coming to the United States told us, I did go to the dentist, but here not exactly a recognized dentist. It was a person, a dentist that came from Mexico and would come to a house and because they charge less, I could say, I wanna have a checkup and see how I look. So um, this was, and we heard about this from a number of people that they were going to, um, you know, people's homes who, perhaps were dentists in their home country but weren't licensed in the United States. Um, we also asked participants about the biggest challenges they faced in obtaining dental care for their children, and overwhelmingly parents responded that insurance was the biggest challenge. Um, the majority of women we spoke with accessed dental care when they were pregnant, as I mentioned, during that window, window of eligibility. Um, and once that window closed, they and their husbands would forego care. Um, one, of the, one of the mothers we spoke with talked about her husband who'd been trying to get in to see a dentist for three years, but they didn't have the money and he was, dealing, he was living with dental pain. It was because he was unauthorized. So he didn't have access to coverage. Um, another mother of two told us many people don't apply or they're afraid of going because they know it's very expensive. Um, and many people don't qualify for Medi-Cal, so they have to pay out of pocket and they don't have the money. Another caregiver elaborated, um, in reality, a lot of our people do not have insurance. And sometimes Medi-Cal, because if you don't have insurance, they don't see you, even if your children were born here. Or even if your children get these privileges, they don't really see you. And this was important because we observed um, when we were in the clinics that a number of the adults bringing children in for care were in need of dental care. Um, you could see it um, and they weren't able to access it. A number of our participants had mixed status families. Either they or some of their children were um, unauthorized while others were. Um, and so navigating the different coverage options was a challenge and made the privileges of citizenship apparent. As this mother of two young boys told us, it's not the same if they're born here compared to if they're not. There's a big difference, and as a mother, that's upsetting. Because he's born here, talking about um, her younger son, he has a few more privileges than the one who wasn't. Because for the one who wasn't, I struggle a little more with looking and waiting for his appointments, how long it will take, seeing whether they'll give it to him or not, and or whether I have to pay and how much. And with the baby, I didn't have to do that. So within families, they're seeing these big differences. So um, a central method that we utilized in our study and that anthropologists use is called participant observation. Um, so this means that we spent time in places with people. Um, we engaged um, with what was happening, we were observing interactions, and taking detailed field notes that included reconstructed dialogue. 
and we did this as quickly after the observation period as possible. Um, and we did this, we conducted participant observation in clinic and community settings in order to get a sense of immigrants' experience with accessing care, because one of the things we were really interested in was the navigational component of oral health literacy. So what does it mean to actually get what you need and to, know, to, uh, to learn how to navigate the system in order to get what you need on behalf of your children? Um, so, for example, research team members would sit in the waiting room of the dental clinic and observe as people interacted with the receptionists, um, how they engaged with the forms that they were asked to fill out, um, and how parents talked to their children about their impending uh, exam. And we were conducting these observations between um, 2014 and, I'm sorry, 2012 and 2014, a time when a substantial number of mom speakers, uh, an indigenous Mayan language, um, migrated to East Oakland. So we observed in that case the extra layer of challenge that these families experienced when they were expected to speak Spanish and they weren't fluent in that language um, and the ways in which the clinic tried to deal with it. Um, so during several such observations, it became clear that the adult, as I mentioned, needed oral, oral care but was unable to access it due to their unauthorized status. And um, so in one case, um, we, one of our research associates, Claudia Guerra, who is a, uh, she has a master's of social work, she's been an ethnographer working on studies with me for many years. Um, she was in a clinic observing in the waiting room and um, one of the things that we would do was, you know, engage in conversations with people in the waiting room and then if they were okay with it, we would follow them in to observe their interactions with the dental hygienist or the dentist to see the kinds of communications that happen in that context. And in this case, Claudia met a um, young mother of a developmentally disabled four-year-old who was there um, seeking care for her child. Um, but it was obvious to Claudia that she had really, she was in urgent care, urgent need of dental care for herself. Her four front teeth were rotting and she was in pretty severe pain. Um, and she had gone to um, the, a, another hospital to seek care for herself, but her only option was to pay out of pocket for, to have the teeth removed and it was gonna cost over $1,000 and she couldn't, she was actually, um, because she was caring for her child couldn't work, so she didn't have the funds to pay out of pocket, and because she was unauthorized, didn't have any other access. So we, so it was myself, um, you, Dr. Heft, um, a couple of other people, we tried all of, we went through all of our networks to try to find care for this person, um, and we were unsuccessful. And I mean, it's great to hear that now the CDC is seeing undocumented patients, but we tried everything. And this person, this woman was living in pain and she had to live with that pain for several more years. Only two months ago, she was able to get her teeth removed at a charity dentist and get dentures. Um, so in one of, you know, as we've talked about a bit today, we're in one of the most highly resourced settings and we weren't able to, she was not able to access care. So this recent study that came out, um, to me, it kind of brings together some of the issues I've been talking about so far around the, um, the immigration environment as well as access to insurance, which are the other policies that I brought up. I brought up the exclusionary policies for related immigration as well as our healthcare policies that make, that limit access. So this study highlights differences in oral health among non-citizen, naturalized citizen, and U.S. born adults, um, and suggests that the downstream impacts of the processes I've been talking about um, are how, how these processes are affecting oral health. So this study uh, uses a nationally uh, representative data set, NHANES, um, and using over 4,500, a sample of over 4,500 um, 
compares the evidence of caries and periodontal disease as well as recommendations um, for oral health care stratified by immigration status. And so in Haines, they actually do the exam, and at the end of the um, exam, the um, participants are given a recommendation for to see a dentist if necessary. So this is what they looked at in this study. And Wilson and colleagues found that more than half of non-citizens uh, received a diagnosis of periodontal disease, and 38% had caries. And for U.S. born, these rates were 34.4% and 27% respectively. And non-citizens, um, they also found that non-citizens had a 60% higher odds of receiving recommendations for oral health care than U.S. born individuals and that naturalized citizens had a significantly lower likelihood of having caries than non-citizens. So the reason why I think this is particularly interesting is that once they adjusted for insurance status, these differences went away. So um, this suggests that um, the, some, I mean, it's, I'd like to suggest that, the, that this suggests um, that some of the exclusionary policies, including the ACA and anti-immigrant state policies um, or, and federal legislation, is, are having an effect. And this, the authors, Wilson and colleagues, state that the, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act helped provide coverage for children by making it one of its essential um, benefits, and we're all really happy about that. But it left out the adults. Um, and as they state, extending these benefits to adults may help mitigate current economic and legal barriers that many immigrants face when accessing oral health care. Um, so as one of our participants stated, having oral health care is a privilege. This is somebody who um, had uh, her, she lost most of her teeth when she was in Mexico as a child. Um, and as she stated, I feel privileged taking my children to the dentist. You feel like you take care of your children and you feel good because you look back at your past and you say, oh no, my child is in heaven. Now, how many people would say their child is in heaven because they get to go to see a dentist? Um, he goes to the dentist, his teeth are well. He doesn't have to deal with the fact that his teeth will rot at the age of 14 or 13 and 14. And I think that's what we all want. And unfortunately, that's not what everyone's getting even here in the US. So um, I hope that um, I've made uh, the point that immigration policy matters. Um, the, and recent research has shown that more inclusive states, such as California and Colorado, have been found to have higher rates of insurance enrollment among Latino non-citizens. So having that inclusive environment can foster enrollment in insurance, whereas these exclusionary environments at the state level will actually uh, foster the fear that keeps people out of care. Um, I also um, I think it's important to recognize that immigrants in this country are becoming a stigmatized population, not just undocumented or unauthorized immigrants, but it, ex it extends to everyone who's sharing ethnicity with those who are being excluded. Um, and that's the point of some of this research, that it is ex it's showing the extension of these effects. And that the US immigration policy environment um, does create a form of structural stigma that affects the health of adults and children. Adults by exclusion and children by association. Um, their children are not getting care because the, the adults are oftentimes afraid that seeking care could put them at risk. Um, so what does this mean for oral health? Um, when I think about what it would mean to take uh, immigration seriously as a social determinant of oral health, I think it means that we would take seriously the impacts of state and fed federal policy on oral health, not just thinking about access, but thinking about the conditions of care. Um, and that we would engage meaning meaningfully with affected populations in order to build trust, but also to identify solutions, um, things that we haven't anticipated. And that it would mean that we would continue these really important and effective interventions um, that are individual level and system level, but that we would look beyond them um, to consider the impacts of federal immigration and state immigrant policies on oral health utilization and conduct the research that we need to to document the effects um, on utilization. 
So lastly, uh, I just want to uh, end with the, uh, the new definition of oral health that was overwhelmingly approved by the FDI World Dental Federation General um, assembly, which it was designed to convey that oral health is a fundamental human right and um, that this definition should facilitate the inclusion of oral health in all policies. That would include immigration policies. Um, and to point out that, um, you know, this is the theoretical model that they, uh, that they identified and driving determinants in their definition of oral health in this model are factors that affect oral health and cover five main domains. And they talk about genetic, biological factors, social environment, physical environment, health behaviors, and access to care. And in the United States, I would just like to um, suggest that immigration policy um, should be considered one of the driving determinants. And so I would like to acknowledge uh, the funding for some of this research that I talked about today, um, the clinics that we partnered with, as well as the research participants who took the time to speak with us and share their stories. Um, and I'd also like to recognize my colleagues from UCSF, Claudia Guerra, Kristen Half, Judith Barker, and Lisa Chung. Um, and then my colleagues from UC Merced, Maria Gonzalez and Andrea Lopez, who have helped me think through some of these issues. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting to learn about this uh, immigration, you know, about oral uh, care, because oral care is so important, you know, because uh, it can lead to those uh, uh, infection or mm -hmm. disease that is the teeth. But I'm, I'm, I want to know under the Obama administration, and they, they cancel the, the dental coverage. Mm -hmm. And uh, how these people get the, you see a dentist, maybe the students operate on dental, dental students. Well, so I think it, it, it depends. I mean, some people can access care through, um, through dental schools. Um, I think we heard earlier today that here at UCSF, recently they're seeing un unauthorized um, immigrants in their free dental clinic. Um, and in Berkeley, the, the free clinic is offering dental services. Um, it's just that these, this access is stratified across the country, um, and there are some environments where it's, people are not able to access care. And so what they are accessing are more informal or um, and, and less regulated uh, sources of care. That was great. I love your legislative approach to understanding why we are here today. Mm -hmm. But you did point out negative legislation, but I, I did want to point out some positive yeah. legislation. And, and that legislation has real impact in California today mm -hmm. and also on our dental students and what you'll be doing. Uh, I'm Leanna Sale, and I'm the director of community-based education and practice here. Mm -hmm. Uh, the FQHC model is the first yes. piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. So at La Clinica de la Raza, mm -hmm. if you're pregnant and you're undocumented, you and all your children have a special day for care mm -hmm. there. And if our student is rotating in, in that, in Oakland, they get all the care they can get done while, uh, and during the perinatal period, both pre and post is mm -hmm. when the access for all, all those documented, and then they keep uh, those patients on because the legislation not only requires dental health, but they get a very high per diem rate. Mm -hmm. So since their per diem rate is anywhere from 185 to $300 a visit, they can do sliding scale mm -hmm. for other patients who are seen for as little as $7. Mm -hmm. So you can continue that patient in their care uh, there. Uh, at Asian Health, for example, you mentioned Hmong patient. Mm -hmm. 80% uh, of the patients there in Oakland have English as not a language. 20% right. uh, speak some English. So that's FQHC model. The second one is federal legislation for dish payments. I was a hospital director, and we received disproportionate share payments mm -hmm. for, uh, for basically unpaid care. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would, we would get divs on that money from central administration based upon how much uncompensated care we delivered. The more we delivered, the more we got paid. 
So that was a way of putting another $300,000 into my dental department's budget every year because of the free care mm -hmm. that we provided. So wherever we had capacity, thanks to federal legislation, we were able to provide free care. So I, just I, what other positive uh, uh, federal legislation do you have in mind? Something good that happened uh, that might help undocumented. Patients. Well, I think it's a, uh, those are really good points, and I think it is really important to recognize that the FQHCs do provide incredible care. And um, I've partnered with a number of FQHCs over the years in my research and strongly, strongly um, respect their models, especially the it, here in the Bay Area, the way in which they do establish a dental home for families at, you know, from the time of birth if possible, um, which is wonderful. Um, my point was that that's the only option that undocumented immigrants have had, the, is the FQHC model. So the ACA did put more funds into the FQHCs, but they excluded the option of buying and getting insurance on the exchanges for people. So it's just, it, it doesn't give them the choice that everybody else has. Um, but yes, there is positive legislation. And as our earlier speaker pointed out, right now in California, we have um, more support for oral health infrastructure development than ever before. And so I'm very, very hopeful. I'm working um, actually in collaboration with my colleague, Maria Elena Gonzalez, with uh, public health departments in the Central Valley to help develop that infrastructure. Um, and we're really excited about what that's going to look like. I do that with the eye that these are kind of, these are the things we need to pay attention to, and these are the kind of populations that we have to make sure get covered as well in whatever we build. You know, I just wanted to do a, a follow-up, an explanation to what um, um, you had said about the dental care being cut in, during the Obama administration. So. Just to be clear, right, in the United States, as relates to oral health dental care, the only group that has 100% universal coverage under Medicaid, as dictated by the federal government, is US-born children, zero through 21. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, whether it's a US-born adult, or an, uh, an immigrant child, or an immigrant adult, is optional in the state at the state level. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have 50 different levels of coverage for adults and anybody else in 50 different states. So what happened, it was actually not Obama, and I, I know this is being recorded, that cut adult dental in California, it was Jerry Brown, right. okay? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, because it was optional in our state, and when the economy he tanked, it went away. And in the same way, Actually, it's also been under Jerry Brown that it came back and that the coverage under SB 70, which covered undocumented children, you know, that was added two years ago, also passed under him. So everybody else except for U.S. born kids, zero to 20, it just depends what state you're in, mm -hmm. whether or not you have coverage. So a few more things to do to um, wrap up our afternoon today. First of all, thank you very much to all of our speakers. That was outstanding. Really appreciate um, your effort to put that together and to inform us and allow us to participate. Thank you so much to all our presenters. There is a long list of people to thank in the back of the program or, well, maybe in the middle of the program or so. Um, couldn't happen without a whole bunch of people working on this program through a long period of time leading up to it. Our whole steering committee um, from school leadership, from leadership at the Institute for Global Health Sciences at UCSF really create an environment where something like this um, is really supported and really embraced. Um, thank you to everyone who came out today, uh, our trainees, our faculty members, our visitors, our friends, our people from the community. It's wonderful to see you here and to participate. Um, Megan Rilla and Roger Moraz, uh, they absolutely made today happen. Thank you to them so much. Um, <laughs> been on the phone with them, on email with them, and uh, so many conversations happened that didn't involve me to put that together that um, really made this day 
happen for sure. Um, Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies have been co-sponsor of our event, I think, for three, maybe four years running now. Um, huge, huge thanks to them. They um, make this video happen, um, and being here today is a big, big plus, so thank you to them. And a long list of volunteers, you can see them in the book, um, Dorian and Amelia and, and Will and all our volunteers from CSU East Bay and UC Berkeley uh, helping to check people in, run the mics around, uh, and just make this work smoothly. One last piece of business, uh, you've probably seen in your program, we've uh, traditionally always had an award for our students who have done just exemplary work in global oral health. Uh, this year is no different, we've had a great number of students working on different projects in different parts of the world on different topics with their mentors. Uh, but this particular year, we want to recognize a team of students. We rolled out something new, something a little bit bold two years ago, which was instead of having a global research project, international, we wanted a project that was right here with our partners. You saw partner, partner, partner exclamation point up on the slides. It was very much something we wanted to embrace here in our school. And Jean Calvo, Irene Ching, and Jun Soo Kim took that and ran with it. Uh, along with their mentor, Dr. George Taylor, they decided they wanted to do something here in San Francisco. Uh, they partnered with a project, Project Homeless Connect, with the San Francisco Dental Society, and they really decided connecting, not just this addressing a need, but what we've seen in our presentations was when you address a need for health, you uh, couple that with planning, with evaluating, with really um, learning from what you do so that the next thing that can be done can be done better. So, Jean, Irene, Jung-Soo, if you could please come up. I've got some plaques for you and some applause. <laughs>